My review process isn't really that different from other reviewers that I've met while working as a professional in the games media industry. One of our writers had somehow added a portion that was taken from a pre-existing article. That's unacceptable, and all of us here apologize for letting that sneak in. On screen are definitions for the word plagiarism as defined by Merriam-Webster, Dictionary.com, and the University of Oxford. I'm showing multiple sources defining plagiarism, but the overall definition is going to boil down to this. Plagiarism is to take someone else's idea as their own or to not credit the source. I never intended for any of that to, any of that stuff to be in the videos. In most cases, I didn't write it, but I should have, you know, it was my face on the channel. It was my name on the channel. I should have been... So about that James Summerton video, let me go ahead and click on it and take a look. And, uh, oh, he already deleted it. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. You know that trick video essayists use where they open on a semi-related example that sets the stage for the wider topic? It's a classic. I do it all the time. Hi, everyone. It's me again with a holly jolly candy cane-esque look and squish gang is present i'm holly jolly pre-christmas and this is my gift to all of you my highly requested video of the rhetoric of h bomber guys plagiarism and youtube video and because this took me so long james somerton's apology video that was sneaky deleted within less than 12 hours of its existence. We're going to be viewing plagiarism through a more academic context as someone who just survived grad school and has kind of done the process of applying plagiarism and all those things in an academic context. I have a master's degree, master's of arts in teaching English. So teaching how to write. So that's plagiarism and things, big important, very slay. This video is a lot and has a lot of difficult content. And there may, there may be parts of my analysis that you're not necessarily a fan of, or you don't necessarily agree with. Or there are going to be parts that are taking in my personal context, which isn't the same as yours. I ask that you at least wait for the chapter to be done before you comment on videos, or on this particular video, rather. I think something that we need to understand is not every criticism of someone that you like is in bad faith. And I can promise you my criticisms are not in bad faith. It's not even criticisms, plural. There's one part I was a little iffy on, the rest of it I like. I'm also not familiar with H Bomber Guy as a creator. I actually didn't know who he was when people were mentioning his video. It took me over an hour into the video of realizing that that is the Minecraft oof sound guy. So the way that I spent over 10 hours just writing the script and I still said Minecraft oof, instead of Roblox. I meant Roblox, I promise. That's all I knew. So this video is focusing specifically on plagiarism and YouTube. So if you found that, oh, well, you didn't understand this point because of this other one of his videos, it's because I didn't watch it. When I do the rhetoric of, and it's involving a video, it's because it's looking at that video in particular, not the creator as a whole. That's why I have different titles and things of the sort. I just want to make that abundantly clear just because of this live stream I did last week that was a little bit of a mess. Link source of ways to support the channel and my social media links are all down below along with all different things an email to suggest content and members and patrons and other such things. You can access it down below. Patrons and members, thank you very kindly. Names on screen. I'm trying to get through this intro as fast as possible. There is going to be three major parts of the video. However, due to the length of the video mentioned, I there is... I think eight hours worth of video content that I have to discuss in this, there is going to be sub chapters. So let's say like section 1.2 X, Y, Z, whatever. So there's three parts. Part one is context, Philip and cinema, uh, Cinemasker. Part two, Illuminati, content farms, internet historian. And part three, James Summerton, sociology, YouTube essay, and apology. Another thing, Cinemasker spe specifically, I have a little bit of a stutter. Uh, especially when I'm anxious and I don't like filming. So if I stutter saying Cinemassacre or the following words and I can't quite edit it smoothly, that is why. Because it's one of those things that I can't, like it kind of happens every single time I do it. So let's get right into it. Context, Philip, and Cinemassacre. They were already doing it. For those of you who I assume 
is very few who are maybe not aware of H Bomber Guy or this video, Plagiarism and YouTube. It is an almost four hour long YouTube essay that dives into the issues of plagiarism, fair use, content theft, content production, all outside of the more shallow lens of just criticizing YouTube reaction content. Because as far as like mainstream YouTube creations, that is the main precipice of what we've received so far. The main kind of basis that we've gotten to this point. We're seeing very few that delve into the more kind of academically structured context that Harris went into in his video. H Bomber Guy's name is Harris for context. H Bomber Guy takes his time to parallel not only the commonly recognized academic context of plagiarism and its effects, such as just stealing someone else's paper, or video or whatever, but the more hidden and convoluted ways in which it can present itself online. This video being composed of 19 chapters with a runtime of three hours, 51 minutes and nine seconds breaks different internet creators down in relation to how they've plagiarized along with some side co commentary on different forms of content, all designed to build to the main thesis relating to James Somerton. The creators mentioned as a point of focus are Philip Sin Cinemassacre, Illuminati, the internet historian, and James Somerton. Now we'll talk about Philip and Cinemassacre specifically in this part. Again, I've mentioned that we're getting into everyone else later down the line. These are the two creators that I just felt like were the most simple and an open closed case. So that's why I, I combined it with the context chapter. Frankly, this video, Plagiarism and YouTube, becomes more impressive as you look into it more and contextualize it as a, almost a, a piece of literature. Because the thing that makes plagiarism so bad is you often can't find it unless you're aware of the source material or intimately involved with the style of content that that person makes or the writing ability of that person. So let's say, for example, you start teaching a class and you have their papers, you receive papers from them a week later. You're not going to really be able to tell yet what students are able to produce X type of work. So let's say there's a student who normally performs on a lower end who gets their dad to write the paper for them and submits it to you. If it's that early in, you're not necessarily going to be aware. So people viewing these videos in passing aren't necessarily going to be aware of the plagiarism because it is so specific to the content that they've stolen from. And a lot of YouTubers, like me included, their viewership is only 50% of people who are subscribed to them. And sometimes it's a bit higher, sometimes it's a bit lower. So most people who are not necessarily intimately aware of your content style or ability when they're viewing you. So on YouTube, that makes plagiarism a lot easier to do because people are not necessarily going to be aware if that specific video of yours that they're watching is unique to your content or is completely different writing style than yours than usual because they're only watching that video in isolation. And remember that most creators don't provide text slash scripts or follow alongs with the YouTube content and the YouTube content is often watched in passing. If you want to see the script for this video, I scroll through it on a video on Twitter slash X. You can follow me down there. It is on uh, in the description. So I have put this script up online, not like just the still images. I just have a video of me scrolling through it. You can pause it and read it if you want, just to prove that that is the thing that I'm going to be using. Because when you have a video like this that's on plagiarism, I wanted to have an open transparency as to what materials I've made, put into, provided, and what and how unique my spin might be on something like this. So when you're watching these videos in passing on YouTube or you're not familiar with the creator at hand, you're not necessarily intimately reacting or viewing something as if you would if you were reading the script directly. And when there's no transcripts, you have to do audio transcription of the words that they're using and then feed it through something to find the plagiarism, which is a difficult process. Some of these people, specifically a lot of it being James Somerton, were very lazy. So you could actually look up direct quotes in, in Google and they would come up. But still, if you look into H Bomber Guy's video, the sheer amount of plagiarism that happens and the length of the parts is extensively needed to be researched. And I just think that the fact that all this was found by Harris and the internet sleuths alike is just incredibly impressive. So now getting onto the first creator, Philip or Philip Mewson. Philip Mewson is a game console slash tech reviewer, or he was, I guess, rather, uh, who also looks at Nintendo-related news, such as game and console announcements. Philip's videos looked good, had a nice camera and lighting set up, quick edits, nice things like that. Harris calls out the uh, edits as just throwing presets together. Now, I'm going to keep it real with y'all. Well, any of you who have watched more than one of my videos, my editing is bad. <laughs> My editing is bad because I, one, use Sony Vegas. Two, I don't know anything about the presets or where to find them safely or how to use them because I'm just doing one thing at a time. 
I am fully self-taught for video editing. I don't know anybody else who knows how to do it. I don't know who could teach me how to do it. I don't want to buy a Mac, so I don't want Final Cut, and I don't want to pay $60 bi-weekly for Adobe Premiere Pro. And Vegas, you can buy one shot, so that's what I did. So that is why mine aren't nice. And while Harris, you know, knows how to do edits, and he's like, this is so easy, I'm still kind of jelly of the people who have any semblance of understanding how to do anything. Philip is is presented as a well-known example of plagiarism as building the example. And I do agree because upon looking deep, I looked into each of the creators separately after just to kind of see what the vibes were like. Philip's thing specifically was very spoken, like spoken about very heavily on YouTube with a lot of references from other creators. There were videos with hundreds of thousands of views commenting on Philip's plagiarism. The issue with him, right, in particular was he didn't only plagiarize for his own benefit, but upon working for a gaming content slash news company called IGN. So now he's doing this from like the standpoint of a corporate conglomerate. So our first aspect of the rhetoric component, we're going to look at the sort of Phillips kind of my response video. And I could only find commentary on it. I could not find a re-upload of it. I even think through Google, I kind of try to find it through like, I was trying to figure out how the Wayback Machine works, but I'm not very smart. Things, looking things up through like the like niche internet websites is a lot different than like a university library. I never said my uh, online research skills are good for like creators and things like that. I don't know how to do stuff like, for example, like I'm not very good at going through like Kiwi farms. So there's definitely like obviously like limitations to me, which is why I also commend Harris for this video. I could only find the commentary video called Philip Mewson's non-apology response uh, by the channel Sale. I'm sorry. The, I have it on screen right now. Somebody, how do I pronounce it? One of the first clips that Sile puts in uh, has Philip immediately throwing other reviewers under the bus, essentially by just stating that like, oh, lots of people just steal stuff in the process. My review process isn't really that different from other reviewers that I've met while working as a professional in the games media industry. Other reviewers in your industry do not plagiarize other people's work, and that's what you did, Philip Mewson. You plagiarized somebody else's work, fully intending to get away with it because the thought you likely had was that this is a nobody. Nobody's gonna recognize if I just lift this freaking review right off of this small YouTuber and pass it off as my own. That's what you did. You did that, Philip Mewson. You plagiarist. And the formula stays the same for whatever product I'm reviewing. Plagi like it genuinely just says like that the, his process was the same as everybody else's, which then kind of parallels it with, well, if you're criticizing me, why aren't you criticizing everybody else who ever makes reviews, despite the fact that their reviews are from their own actual standpoint. There is more rambling throughout the video with excuses that essentially the notes got put in from slipping through the cracks. Now, what I do when I write videos is I start with my opinion and I write some stuff. And then when I get to a point where I need to look something up, then I look up the thing. It's not my my script bases are not from the standpoint of someone else's product directly as the first point. It's my thought, my structure upon the first the product, and then I integrate it afterwards. That's also how I wrote papers. Do an introduction and and then I would write the whole thing. And then I would do the body paragraphs of just my own words. And then I would put like citation, 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 citation all over the paper. This is a tip that I give when I private teach as well in order to avoid any plagiarism where your ideas are not the forefront of the work that you're doing and you're producing. Then he gets a victim complex that genuinely, I only think social media influencers are capable of, where he claimed he was, because he was named publicly in the allegations, the other person, in this case, the news editor for the article that came out about it, Jason Schreier, was chasing clout on his name. So oh. you can keep looking, Kotaku, and, and by the way, their their news editor, Jason Schreier, tried to imply that my FIFA 18 review was also inauthentic by claiming that I copied it from Nintendo Life. Oh, you know, I might come to a conclusion like that is because you're a plagiarist. You're a plagiarist, Philip Mewson. That's just so not the case. I mean, maybe he was implying that if you have similarly opinionated reviews, then you're just plagiarizing, or maybe he's just trying to get as many clicks off of my name right now as possible. Ooh, see, here's why I love this comment. Because Philip Mewson must be under the impression that people give a shit about Philip Mewson. You're not why this story is relevant. You worked for IGN, and you stole someone else's work. And the only person who deserves attention is Boomstick Gaming, the person you have not apologized to. Imagine. Um, maybe this happened, I don't know. Imagine like OJ Simpson. <laughs> Imagine like OJ Simpson, okay, goes to court in like the 90s. 
And our man is like, y'all just want to be famous for talking about me. Like genuinely, like James Charles and allegations for being a guy who messages minors. And he's literally said like allegations are reported on to chase clout. We live in a society. That's all I'm going to say about that one. So then IGN dumped this man immediately, put out a statement, which I will play most of right now. I'll clip some of the unnecessary parts. After allegations were brought against an IGN staff member for his review of dead cells, we conducted an investigation of this editor's process, ultimately leading to taking down the review in question and parting ways with this writer yesterday. We will work tirelessly to ensure that regardless of whether or not you agree with our reviews, you can have faith that every word is nothing less than the genuine opinion of our critics. We sincerely apologize to our readers, Motion Twin, and most especially, the YouTuber known as Boomstick Gaming for failing to uphold these standards. So Philip needed a scapegoat fallacy, which he put towards other game reviewers because it looks really, really bad when the company dumps you right away. Like kind of, that's kind of like a clearly something bad has happened type vibe. You know, it's obvious why people like not just Philip, but the other creators that have their response in this case feel the need, such a strong need to shift blame in this scenario because it's 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 so much farther beyond just avoiding criticism because plagiarism in the production space, which is like videos, books, novel, like no, books and novels. Great. Mika, you're a genius. Like no, articles, journalism, things of the sort. It is a career ending allegation, especially when it is something that is viewed in the public eye because people get a certain pleasure, a certain connection, a certain viewpoint from your writing. And when that is pulled out from under you, why would they visit you? someone who is just recycling other stuff instead of going to those people directly. Philip brings up the review process and how the notes get mixed up. The videos he made, you know, were just kind of a simple process everyone else had. I mentioned this before. But the thing is, he does review videos. What are you reviewing from someone else's point of view? Isn't a review like how I feel about this? Because like, and I know I'm not a makeup girly. I'm not a Jaclyn Hill. I'm not a whoever. I'll be silly on TikTok sometimes and make makeup videos. I want to work with makeup people, but I don't. Point is, I've done kind of makeup review type videos before. It's my opinion. That's what makes it attractive to my content, especially because, for example, there are times where I like makeup products that are considered very unpopular, but my review will be based on my perception. If I just follow what everybody else said, then it wouldn't really make a good point. Like review videos, it's almost like he was plagiarizing story times of himself. You know, he was plagiarizing like life experiences. It's like that is such a very, that's such a strange thing to do. And then having the notes mixed in where your defense is videos that are personality based and based on your personal opinion makes even less sense. So not only have you put yourself in a position where you are stealing other people's content, hypothetically, allegedly in Minecraft, I guess, for legality's sake, but also you're essentially saying that no review is honest because other people are doing the same process. So then you're just showing that you're just lazy and untalented. Like imagine not wanting to actually review a popular video game that you get for free before it comes out for your job. And instead you're so lazy or negligent or overconfident maybe that you're willing to put an entire career on the line just to cut corners in your job. Your job that people are lined up down the block for to take from you upon opportunity presenting itself. So now when we go back to Harris's writing process, which is clearly unique, presenting something like this that is an open and shut case builds a very cohesive thought process. I only have one contradictory, con like I guess, comment to a certain extent to this section. Harris comments on the sort of passive nature that Philip has in the video where he says like, he's not saying like, I'm the one who was doing it, it was me. It was like a we kind of thing. He claims there was a complicated process to making the review with lots of circumstances. The point is to make you wonder what really happened so you forget what happened. Another way of doing this is to be passive about the events, so it's almost like they happened to him instead of being something he did. Like I said, I take full responsibility for what happened with the Dead Cells review. Philip doesn't say, I take responsibility for what I did with my review. He passively takes responsibility for what happened with the review. When someone tries to use language to imply what they did happened by magic, they make it pretty clear they're trying to deceive you. I and he's 100% correct when he says that the passive speech is done for the means of not taking responsibility for your actions. And I mentioned before why I think that's the case. But I also think a big part of it is this sort of like YouTubers think they're lawyers kind of mentality, 
which is funny because I did the hypothetically allegedly in Minecraft like 30 seconds ago. With him specifically, again, he's not only impacted himself, but he's impacted a company a, and a corporate entity. And I think a lot of it is him worry, being very worried and trying to dodge a lawsuit. So this isn't really, I guess, a critique rather, but it's me bringing up another possibility as to why that might be the case. You're subject to copyright law when you make content. Normal people are subjected to copyright law in every context uh, when it comes to most forms of production. So even when like when I did my uh, graduate capstone research project, which I had to do proper citation for in APA format, I had to make a copyright statement. So my work's copyrighted, right? Same thing as these videos. If someone just clips my entire video and re-uploads it, I can sue for copyright. So that's an example of something that kind of, I think it's this sort of like YouTubers think they're lawyers mentality that comes into this as well. Now we move on to Cinemassacre, the name that I can't say without stuttering half the time. This person is a once beloved movie analysis a analyst is the word I was looking for and review channel that has been approached by a YouTube production company. One that clearly did not have great working practices and the content essentially completely changed to dog water, low quality pump out content. I've actually been approached by something like this before a couple of different times and I feel like what they do is they look for super specific niches to can't to kind of um, capitalize on early in hopes of almost making like a media network of your niche to expand upon. This is all alleged. This is my opinion. Thank you. I remember for me in particular, one of them mentioned three times the content production along with consistent monthly sponsorships, SEO optimization and consultation and assistance for making thumbnails. Now, the fourth one I might need, but it is actually I, I need a lot of help with a lot of things. But now, as of like two weeks ago, I can actually do this as like work and not just like doing school and everything as my utmost kind of concern. So maybe I'll be able to figure it out eventually or they see they seek you out in or, and, and do so in a position where they're recognizing that the content process is complex and cumbersome for those who are doing it alone. But then they prey on people who believe in their creativity and then see it as an opportunity to produce more of what they love as opposed to something that creates a machine out of something you once enjoyed and siphons any artistic value from the work itself. And it turns into a content factory rather than an optimized production of your original content. To summarize what happened with Cinemassacre as quickly as possible, and by the way, like obviously watch the H Bomber guy video. It's it's the top link in the description. I'm just it, this is if you've already watched it or for some reason you just really don't want to watch it and you want to see what I have to say about it. You know what I mean? Anyway. So Cinemassacre signed with a production company after saying earlier that his videos could not be redone because they're based on his personal opinions as their reviews. It's the same comment that I had about Philip. Sin Massacre uniquely has the sort of like hypocrisy element that comes in that Philip didn't have. It got so bad that the videos primarily didn't include him anymore. He was a part of some of the videos, not the focus of a lot of them. The formats were changed and the videos were filled to the brim in sponsorships. I remember Harris mentions one where the editor came out and said that one of the it was like a podcast episode was split into three different videos so they could do three different sponsorships. But then Screenwave got involved. For people with better things to do, Screenwave Media is a YouTube network slash influencer agency thing who work with various YouTubers, helping them produce content by editing their videos for them, assisting with writing, and helping them find sponsors. They apparently work with a bunch of channels in various forms, but they work especially closely with Cinemassacre. The writing and editing of the AVGN videos became different and weird, like someone else was doing those parts. The channel started making new types of video, which were like James standing kind of awkwardly in the corner while Screenwave employees discussed a movie. There was a Cinemassacre podcast and James often just wasn't in it. The guy whose channel it was became an optional side character. Oh, and everything became packed with sponsorships. If you don't know, Skillshare- It got so bad, episode 200 of AVGN is split into three videos with separate sponsors, purely because they sold too many brand deals. Oh, we're gonna have to make the uh, episode 200 three episodes because we sold too many brand deals and- uh, they didn't tell James. Girl, I get like three sponsorships a year. Like, what do you mean you're doing one episode with three sponsorships in it? I'm saying that, but later down the line, he talks about an Illuminati video where she plugs her plushies and then has two sponsorship ad reads in it. 
I can't imagine what making money is like. But anyways, like personally, like when I do ad reads, if like I said, the joke about the three sponsors a year, I kind of make a point to space them out as much as possible. And I tend to keep them to my the rhetoric of videos because those are the most work for me. And those ones are the most specific to or they're not specific to me and not time sensitive. So I want them to be integrated with something that I can have more drafts of. And when we go back to plagiarism as a concept, I think the biggest loss truly is the loss of the writer's voice. And for the to relay the importance to you of the author's voice, I have this book called Analysis of Critique, How to Engage and Write About Anything. This is by Professor Dorsey Armstrong of Purdue University. The title of this and the author is also in the description. This particular book, I don't know where to get it. My boyfriend's granddad passed away and I got some of his old books. So... <laughs> Voice is a critical component, I would say, of any kind of writing. From the formal essay to a letter to the editor, to a note you might leave on your neighbor's windshield asking him, please don't park in my driveway. But let's consider an example of how voice can be used both as a means for a writer to establish his or her identity and then how the voice can be used to shape the expectations of your reader. In other words, make them have some idea about what's going to come next. Listen to the quote. Most everybody seems to assume these days that if a guy is, is young and has money, he's looking for someone to marry. What is the sentence trying to say? Think about that for a moment. You could probably sum it up pretty easily. Compared to this version of the same kind of statement, but in a very different style. It is truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. As I'm sure you've noticed, both these sentences say essentially the same thing, but both in very different voices. The first version is that we might imagine a modern person living in the 21st century might say casually while in conversation with friends. The second version, of many of you have no doubt recognized, is the famous opening line of Jane Austen's classic novel, Pride and Prejudice. It is most definitely does not sound like something someone today might say in casual conversation. Rather, it signals and sets the tone for much of what is going to follow in this book. And what follows is a story about the upper class 19th century British people. That's talking about the voice and the different structures of writing and how that can change something a lot. And I think when we go back to this concept of plagiarism, you're not only doing the threat, the theft of someone's labor, but rather also the theft of someone's voice, right? And with that, if you're taking a bunch of random works together, and we get into this more when we talk about James Summerton, you're getting rid of any of the ability to have any uniqueness in the work and to have any cohesion in the work. Because authors' voices are all different. So if you're stealing a bunch of people's, it's like you're trying to cram a bunch of different puzzle pieces together to make a new puzzle. And while I suppose sometimes from two different puzzles, you can shove two pieces together to the where they stick together. On the other hand, there gets to a point where you are no longer able to effectively have your own thoughts and opinions as a writer in a way that makes any sense at all. And it just sounds like you're some sort of kind of robotic figure who is just rambling on and on. This is very similar to what Illuminati's videos are like. I had stopped watching Blair far before the controversy occurred. And it was really because I just felt like her videos were a bunch of different things put together that were just non-cohesive. Like it sounds like someone was reading, which is funny now that in retrospect, it felt like someone was reading me a Wikipedia article and I didn't really realize, it didn't click to me that that would be like plagiarism or anything like that. I never thought much of it really. I was just like, man, this just feels like someone's reading to me from a book or something and I just don't really like it. Turns out that's exactly what it was. And that's why. <laughs> so I guess, you know, real recognize real. Like you recognize it, I guess, when you're familiar enough with it. But with this, we'll move on to part two when we're actually talking about Illuminati in more detail. So part two is Illuminati content farms and internet historian. So I actually avoided watching plagiarism and YouTube at first because I thought it was another Illuminati video. And after making my Illuminati video in June or whatever, or something like that, I was just not looking forward to watching any more content on her. Frankly, there's been updates, cease and desist. There's been stuff with Oz Media. And I've just like, I don't know what it is about me, but even the thought of getting back into that is so mine, it just bogs me down. But I didn't know that the main thesis was related to James Summerton, who was someone who I was also not familiar with. I'm more familiar with other creators in that space. But we'll again, we'll get to that later. The basis of this section referring to Illuminati specifically was building upon the concept of Cinemassacre and the sort of industrialization of his YouTube channel. However, 
This is designed to show the result of when the main purpose of the channel from the get go is that kind of YouTube factory. So I'm slightly more critical of this part in the plagiarism YouTube video, but a lot of the issues that I had are actually cleared up more cohesively, I find, in the 20 minute accompany vi accompanying video on the H Burger Guy channel, which is Harris's second channel. So if you feel like what I'm coming from, the context isn't as clear or whatever, or I'm backpedaling a lot, it's because the opinion, my opinion shifted a bit more when I watched the other video. My gripes with some specifics in relation to smaller content creators is still present, but we get to that in a second. Illuminati makes three 20 minute long YouTube essays a week. A lot of different topics uh, from MLMs, true crime, science, medicine, corporate scams, mismanagement, some sort of celebrity stuff sometimes, not like in a gossip way, in like a more corporate way. So let's say like, for example, talking about goop, talking about what's Courtney's one poop. <laughs> it's like so similar. It's like very, it's like a knockoff name, but those different types of business practices. Now, if you want a channel who doesn't just like steal all the content, uh, Isabella Lantern, is that how you say it? I think so. Anyway, her name, her picture's on screen here and I'll put her channel down below. That's somebody who makes kind of like what Illuminati was going for, but the content's not just like reading Wikipedia pages all the time. Who's As someone who personally makes, I guess, this so-called essay style content, at times I have no idea who they are. I have to, who the people are, I have to comment on. I have no idea where to begin. I am not familiar with the type of content. So I start from the ground up. And for example, with this video, this video came out over two weeks ago because that's how long it took me to figure out who this was, what was happening, who we were talking about, what about them, because this was a corner of YouTube that I'm not familiar with. Even if I go back to my own channel right now, I can look at the amount of people who I have no idea who I was talking about. Daniel Larson and uh, World of T-Shirts, no clue who that was. Matt Reif, no clue who he was. I had no idea who. I talked about true crime. Uh, I talked about, what's her name? Zav Girl, I believe is what her name was. Yeah, Zav Girl and Annie Elise, no clue who they were. So when there's times like this where I go into Brittany Dawn, when I go into different creators that are requested to me or I see something on like, Twitter or Instagram or something that that sparks my interest in talking about them. That is something that takes a long time to build. I would not. There is no way even now that I'm not in school that I would be able to make three video essays on people I've never heard of in a week. Like that's especially like hers are actually like well edited and have like a little like PNG tuber. Uh, I am just me in front of here yapping and I still wouldn't be able to do it even with having two other writers still making a video every single week with like that level of editing that many ad reads doing research in the way that I do it I guess which is like not stealing is a stretch the only reason I'm able to do this in this in these time frames is because I don't edit that well to be honest so I was under the impression as I was mentioning earlier that Blair was just a glorified narrator with a PNG tuber type deal and to a certain degree I was right but I thought she was a narrator for her own like point form boring scripts rather than just rewording all the sources that would be integrated into an actually good script. From this, H Bomber guy starts talking about what he refers to as content farms after this, as, as talking about Blair, right? Here is where my problem starts to build a little bit. When he goes on this rant about drama channels and YouTube and how it's the worst corner of the internet. The feelings I have about this stem specifically to the drama channel stuff and how like this like worst corner of the internet thing I just it's it's something that gets thrown around a lot as a means of degrading someone's ability to make content content mills as a way that Harris refers to them are channels that put out content summarizing other content this he says this earlier in the video he's talking about like those reddit ai voice videos he's talking about the reddit post reading videos like when people do them there's these videos apparently that summarize movie plots i've never heard of those never seen them but that's something else also i guess 
phrase content mill refers to organizations which produce huge amounts of material very quickly, designed to get attention, with no interest in quality. If you've ever seen an article in a search with a compelling title but which says nothing for several hundred words and only tells you the thing you wanted at the end while showing you seven million ads, you've had the content mill experience, my friend. Some of these are just a link to a video someone else made, but they got to show you ads. There's a ton of channels out there whose objective is to make as much stuff as possible as fast and as easily as possible. We just watched Cinemassacre become one of these, making easier, lower effort, worse videos, and for the ones that were supposed to be good, outsourcing the editing to a guy they underpaid so badly he later quit, and the writing to a guy who turned out to be stealing shit. The quality suffers, yeah, but if you don't care about quality, you save yourself a lot of time and effort. The people who are in this for the money are engaged in a constant race to the bottom, to find the easiest possible content to make and still get paid for it. If you're a nerd, and look at you, you've been recommended a YouTube short where a robot explains what happens in a comic. Moving on from the definition once he does so, it moves to the Legal Eagle section. H Bomber Guy made the original tweet about Illuminati plagiarizing the um, documentary that talked about the autism and vaccines correlation by Andrew Wakefield. What happened was essentially that people, I have, okay, here's the other thing. And this might sound kind of mean, and I don't mean this to be mean, but this is just something to consider, I guess. But I understand that it doesn't take into account his point necessarily, but some, not everybody knows who you are. And I say this because, and I don't even remember if I even included the tweet in the video or if I used a clip from somebody else. I thought H Bomber guy was like a, like a, like a reply guy on Twitter. That's just me having no idea who he is. Okay. That has nothing to do with his content. It has nothing to do with who he is as a person. This because I had never seen, no videos ever been suggested to me. No one I know has ever talked about him. No one, I, I've never seen anything. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, it's just like a reply guy on Twitter who like bodied her, rightfully so. So then it's it's not like another creator where I I want to make an effort. No, not that I want to make an effort either. This is a little bit off script, but it's, I didn't think about it as, a creator criticizing another creator. I thought it was just somebody found the little clip of the video and was like, I know what this is. And they just put it up. I still, and the other thing is too, the other videos that talk about him that he's criticizing that people are using his video clip, but then crediting other people, his at is clearly present in those clips, right? I suppose they didn't link it to the original thread, which is also a bit problematic, but I just think it's going on this like drama channels are the worst people ever and because they they clip from each other's videos it's still the original sourcing i think that that's a bit of a stretch i will get to this like a little bit down the line but again i really just want to clarify it's more so the alignment that is weird to me where you're essentially comparing drama channels that include tweets in their videos and might get those tweets from other videos in the same breath as Blair, who has fully stolen scripts. Now, like I said, I don't remember if I included the tweet or not in my video, but I could not imagine the solidity of an argument if let's say Harris said to me that my video was a lazy plagiarized you know, crap piece because I took a clip from somebody else of a screen record of a tweet. You see what I'm saying? I just thought that was a bit of like a weird jump that felt more like a personal vendetta thing than an actually well-formed section in conjunction to like everything else that's there. That's really my thing. I just thought it was a bit weird. So once the content farms section ends and the expose tweet happens and everything, he goes into the comparison of the definition of plagiarism from Blair and from the dictionary. <laughs> and in Blair's video, she does something weird when she has the one that she uses and the one that she actually cites. There is an incredibly interesting out that she uses where she says plagiarism could also be passing someone else's work off as their own or you hear that or not citing a source properly. So here's my advice for all my little besties, the like six of you who are high school age that watch my videos or college or anything like that. You can have something perfectly sourced top to bottom, as in like everything that you reference, you credit. 
if too much of it is not yours, it's still plagiarism. If you write a thousand words and 900 of them are someone else's, even if you put the parentheses, author page number, author year, God forbid you have to do Chicago and you got to do those footnotes. If you're doing that, it doesn't matter. None of it is your words. It's still plagiarism. It's interesting that she provides that just citing the source properly can make it not plagiarism. It's like, no, girl, you got to do some work. That's the point. And this is something that I don't remember if I said in my original video on Blair or not. And if I didn't, I should have, or I think I intended to. But the use of or in relation to that plagiarism definition is blatantly disregarding other definitions and gives her room to pass something off as her own as long as sometimes there's parentheses and, and citation uh, in place. However, there are people who thankfully know better, such as Harris. And for one, even if we follow the definition, she's still passing off too much stuff as her own, given especially the misleading nature of her citations. Even when you're somewhat paraphrasing in any context in academic works, citation is necessary. There are things where you do like multiple citations grouped together, things like that. And what she does is she leaves ambiguity cited in her own work, which is plagiarism. So I just did the capsule research project December 5th or something like that. And it was like, I remember I had a 25 page paper and six pages of references, right? So anything that I even like slightly paraphrase or if it could have possibly not been common knowledge and I could have possibly thought about it from somebody else's thing, you have to figure out if you thought about it or not. Like you can't breathe without citing somebody else, even if it's a sentence that I constructed and it's a little bit combined with my own thoughts. Now, obviously you don't cite your own thoughts as somebody else. I'm talking about like me thought sentence, me, yes, my thought sentence, then sentence with the specific point of knowledge and then crediting those people and continuing on. I think the thing is, is that the citation process is designed to put people in the direction of the original researcher. It's not just done to get someone off your ass. It's, it's not just something that's designed to make it more annoying for you. It's, it's so that authors can contribute to each other's work and can build upon each other in the academic context or the artistic context or any other context in which you desire to look into and allows for this exchange of knowledge in a way that isn't just putting up people who happened to have presented it maybe in the most digestible way, who happens to be in the most popular, who happen to have XYZ advantage over those original authors. Now, I sense like that there is a notion or maybe a little bit of a feeling of hypocrisy where I go on this huge thing about how the point of citing somebody is to lead them to their work but at the same time, I'm like, why is Harris so mad about a tweet? Again, what I'm saying is, is that more loose practices that still show the actual works, as in like they're still clipping them and they're not claiming to have found the video themselves, as in the one that Harris brought forward of the Andrew Wakefield documentary. I just don't think it's comparable to someone who plagiarizes the entire script top to bottom, left and right. Would those practices pass in this academic context? No. Do I make an effort to not do such practices? Yes. I just want to make that clear. Again, just something that I feel like is a bit different in this video. As a, So when I was watching this video for the second time, I watched it all the way through three times, plus the editing process, which will be epic and slay. And I'm totally... Looking forward to that. It's going to be incredible. When I was watching it the second time with a friend of mine, we had it playing while we were cleaning and things like that. There was a comment that she made that I loved. She said, you cannot write an entire paper that has one quotation mark at the start and then one at the end. But if you pop a citation on and a work cited, it can be yours. It's still plagiarism. So she's essentially saying like, you can submit a paper that's just someone else's and you tell them that it's someone else's it's still plagiarism you just admitted to it instead now i move on to the part that like specifically irked me so this is a part that my chat was arguing with me existing and i said that it existed and i had to play this part through a few times and i'm gonna quote it directly before i even put it in sadly illuminati is not a unique story she is the most prominent tip of the iceberg of the content mill video essay garbage 
if you want to see these extremely poor practices in action, you need only watch the videos about Illuminati. You know, drama YouTube, the worst part of YouTube. If you want to check for yourself if this is real, 1 hour, 21 minutes, 39 seconds. Say garbage. If you want to see these extremely poor practices in action, you need only watch the videos about Illuminati. You know, drama YouTube. The worst part of YouTube. Koba says point of view, showing a picture of a man with a hatchet, who I assume is H Bomber guy, but I'm not too sure to be honest. Drama YouTube is its own sub ecosystem of content mills, grinding out infinite buckets of slop about whatever's happening in that moment. So I'm not gonna milk this anymore after this video, okay? These people are so busy making the videos, they don't even have time to find out what Blair did. They're finding the most popular tweets on the topic and hitting the record button. Not enough that they steal ideas. They have to go out of their way to slander others' work for having the most banal similarities. Yeah, that's right. Wait, banal. And in their most evolved form, they're not even doing that. They're watching other drama videos and making their own version. I've seen the compilation I made of Blair copying Dia in like 40 different places at this point, but what's really amazing about it is that it's now crossed the drama mill event horizon. So instead of being credited to me, it's credited to the other drama YouTubers the current drama YouTuber got it from. In this instance, the previous drama YouTuber's name isn't even spelled right. That's the level of research we're dealing with here. I don't really care about getting credit for a video I made in five seconds. The point I was trying to make was that Dia is the guy who deserves the credit, but there's still an irony to it. I was trying to make a point about the importance of crediting people correctly, and now my Twitter video has human centipeded its way out of the annals of drama YouTubers into the mouths of second order drama YouTubers who don't even know where it's from, but are ready to reheat and serve it. This is the lowest effort shit you can imagine. They can't even spell plagiarist right. He also directly calls YouTube, uh, drama YouTube a subgenre of content mills. So then he plays a sequence of drama videos, including that included his tweet in some regard in the sequence. And it's just a bit strange because some of the channels he includes are not, are, are, are objectively not drama mill content channels, like iNabber and Vangelina Scoff. Especially if we're talking about iNabber because the, vid, the clip that he took from iNabber's video of his tweet was like a three hour long video that took like months to make, right? So it's again, something that I think was a bit of a stretch pull in that way that he did I just think maybe it just wasn't constructed the best that's just my personal opinion though again don't hate everything I'm saying because I have a bit of criticism about this sort of flagrant throwing of the drama content thing and this is because and this comes from the perspective I create right I make content so a lot of people say that people are drama channels or gossip or whatever just to create divides and degrade content for example, the male commentary co community will call most female commentary channels drama channels in order to just kind of degrade what they're making and the content that they produce. And there are two criticisms that I personally have as a small creator, and this ends any criticism I have of the video, I think, at all. So one, I'm seeing this as a femme presenting creator that makes commentary content often in relation to current events as they happen online. And this is a comment that is very often used frequently to dismiss myself and other people like me who are making this content. Do I think that's what Harris is doing? No, I just think it's why it annoyed me. You know, I'm giving you the reason why it irked me, not necessarily that this is definite perception of his content. Earlier in the video, Harris brings up that channels like Blair's should make one really good video a month as opposed to making three videos a week. Now, here's my issue with that, because then you can argue that, well, Mika, maybe you're just annoyed because you don't put in research like Harris did for this video and you should just make a video a month or whatever. If you're a small channel and you make a video a month, you will stay a small channel unless you make like something that happens to pop off. Your algorithm dies if you make less than one video a week. That's at least for me. And I, I know this because my subscriber growth, my view counts, and my overall suggested clicks and, and, and all that kind of stuff, which they give you all the analytics for, but I can't, I'm not giving you my analytics on screen. Okay, I'm allowed to keep some things to myself. But anyway, mine went down like 50% when I started my teaching internship because I was only able to upload three videos a month, more or less. I think just being able to go just make less, like like just put out a video a month is not realistic if you're a smaller channel trying to grow. Now, someone like Blair is very possible because she has an audience and she could just make, she could even make like one hour long or two hour long video a month that would pop off because you already have the momentum from your subscriber count 
And when you have higher subscriber counts, higher view counts, higher share rates, things like that, you will be put in the algorithm regardless. But I guess it was just like, I'm thinking about this in the context of myself and I'm like, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I guess that's probably why it annoyed me a little bit more. I hope that was clear. I'll answer questions about it in the comments. It's just, if it gets a little bit too egregious again, then I'm just not gonna bother. That's my only part of the video where I'm a little bit kind of like, well, you have a million subscribers, you upload once a year. It's a bit of a different scenario for you than most other creators, including the ones that you added into that sequence. Again, I find that the second channel videos explanation is better because with the infrequent citations, it makes people believe that they're being served well thought out and dependable content and good information when instead they're just getting haphazardly put together YouTube Wikipedia article videos. And that's not what they're signing up for, but the citation format makes it feel more like an academic paper. However, I also understand that I guess to boil all of it down as far as what irked me, I just think maybe taking a tweet from a drama video isn't necessarily comparable to, and it's just how the video is sequenced that to like what Blair's doing, for example. Now the video moved on to internet historian and a very popular video about a man in a cave or something. This part presented a case where a creator purposefully was constantly changing a video and re-uploading it and doing a bunch of edits to it and things like that to cover up plagiarism and was doing so from positioning it from, oh, YouTube's copyright system is the issue as opposed to being called out for plagiarism. I don't have too much to say about the internet historian stuff because a lot of it was just very niche corrections on what was happening in the video and talking about like how he talked about it on Patreon and things of the sort. I'm not into inter internet historian and I just think this part wasn't necessarily something that like needs to be delved into too much. It appeared to just be a setup for another component because it was like done for the catalyst of the video, James Summerton. And with that part, we're gonna move to part three. For this section, I want to expand my research beyond H Bomber Guy and included more updates from beyond the point of this video. In the middle of the scripting process, literally at night, while I was sleeping, I woke up to both hearing that James Summerton apologized and also that the video is deleted. You saw that from Tipster's tweet in the opening sequence. Here's what I'll go over in this section. So these are all gonna be all of your sub chapters. So you're gonna have 3.1. 3.1 is gonna be talking about H Bomber Guy's video. Then part 3.2 is gonna be, I fact checked the worst video essays on YouTube by Todd in the Shadows and James Summerton and Community Solidarity by Jesse Gender After Dark. Then 3.3 .3 is going to be going over James Summerton's apology video. The video built up to this point. That was what it was doing. From showing Philip's sloppy theft of niche articles to Cinemassacre made a, making an industrialized content farm, writers that contributed to plagiarism, then Illuminati to show the defense of plagiarism when it is manipulated, when it's constructed in a manipulative way. And finally, the internet historian who does, who tries to escape plagiarism allegations through blaming the YouTube copyright system and other elements of the platform. All of this together are things that James Summerton does and bleeds into what he's like. So I appreciate how this video has an underlying but important kind of main caveat to the thesis that presents kind of James Summerton's power on the platform as a very popular LGBTQIA plus creator. And given James's history of not only plagiarism, but misrepresenting a lot of information regarding gay movements through embellishing things, reading too deep between the lines and issues with sourcing the video. This is something that is very important because it's kind of making the gay community look bad in their video essay content production when that's kind of one of the biggest players. This section begins with presenting the twist that is about James Summerton. James was a video YouTube essayist who focused on media and film and context, especially around the gay community and how it kind of bleeds into modern society. If it isn't already clear, with the current political climate where there are literally entire media conglomerates dedicated to devaluing and spreading misinformation towards LGBTQIA plus creators, both online and in traditional media, it is so crucial to have, to not have one of the most lucrative and big creators be giving, be, to have them give ground for these people to criticize them. You know what I'm saying? Like, the people like the Daily Wire, to summarize what I'm saying in a more clear way, take an inch, give them an inch, they will take three miles. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if the Daily Wire finds one essay that says something 
incorrect about the gay community's context around something, they'll then bleed that out dry and make like six videos on it and make sure that that's the message that comes. Jaden's videos with the visual production elements present themselves as these deep and thoughtful video essays as opposed to even somebody like Illuminati who's kind of just recycling research works as their own. Now, I am one who uses research works in my videos very frequently. And if what I'm referencing isn't in a video I played for you directly, it's a research article that I put on screen with a text, or if it's a long reading from something like a book, I will introduce the book and I will have it in the description. Speaking of which, I'm pretty sure most of you have an idea what happens in this video beyond this point, and it just focuses on specific instances relating to James and the issue with the responsibility that he has with having his platform and how it's really important to credit people and not steal their work. I think something that we want to do as well is I want to comment on the particular genre of the queer centered video essays and the weight of the genre and the presentation of the content when it's in that context. And I think that this builds up a certain ethos of or did, I guess, rather build a certain ethos for James as someone who was more intellectually sound in his video production than he actually was. Maybe not sound, but like complex. It created a sort of backing for his own credibility. Now, there is an influential rhetoric essay that describes the weight of genre as a means of communication and social action titled Genre as Social Action by Carolyn R. Miller, and I'm going to read from it right now. Situations are social constructs that are results not of perception, but of definition, because human action is based on and guided by meaning, not only by material causes at the center of an action is a process of interpretation. Before we can act, we must interpret the indeterminate material environment. We define or determine a situation. It is possible to arrive at common determinations of material states of affairs that may have many possible interpretations because Alfred Schultz, Schultz has argued that our stock of knowledge is based upon types. We can imagine a type to be like a line of demarcation which runs between determinations explicated on the basis of hetero existing relevant structures and the unlimited possibilities for the determination of experience. In other words, our stock of knowledge is useful only so far as it can be brought to bear upon a new experience. The new is made familiar through the recognition of relevant similarities. Those similarities become constituted as a type. A new type is formed from the typification already on hand when not adequate to determine the new situation. If a typification proves continually useful for mastering states of affairs, it enters the stock of knowledge and its application becomes routine. Although types evolve in this way, most of our stock of knowledge is quite stable. Schultz notes that because the types are created and shared through communication, they can come to reside in language. Whatever is typically relevant for the individual has the most part already typically relevant for the predecessors and, cons and, con and consequently deposed its se semantic equivalent into the language. In short, the language can be, can be construed as the sentimentation of a typical experimental schemata which are typically relevant in society. People use big words. They're a little bit too big for, ne for my opinion, for what's necessary. Anywho, then there's this other section that just says, if a rhetorical situation is not material or objective, but a social construct or sem semiotic structure, how are we to understand exigence, which is the core of a situation? Exigence must be located in the social world, neither in a private perception nor in a material circumstance. It cannot be broken into components without destroying it as a rhetorical and social phenomenon. Exigence is a form of social knowledge, a mutual construing of objects, events, interests, and purposes that not only links but also makes them what they are, an objectified social need. This is quite different from Blitz characteris Blitzer's characterization of exigence as a defect or danger. Conversely, although exigence provides the rhetor with a sense of rhetorical purpose, it is clearly not the same as the rhetor's intention for what can be ill-informed, dissembling, or at odds with the situation conventionally supports. The exigence provides the rhetor with socially recognizable way to make his or her intentions known. It provides an, an occasion and thus a form for making our public or making public our private versions of things. So I think what I'm getting at with these super lo that super long reading, but she's the writer is very wordy, is that people are basing their opinions on James off of other creators in the space that they've seen before. So the credibility of people like Jesse Gender, people like, uh, well, H Bomber Guy's whole list or H Bomber Guy himself, is that they're basing that credibility off of their willingness to watch James's content. And James kind of going off of the genre and the format that that is popular and has proven to be effective in the past 
is giving is building up his own credibility for something that he hasn't actually earned. So now with that, and we come to this concept of how he's kind of piggybacking off of also other genres and formats in order to be seen as much more credible than he really is, we'll move on to the Todd in the Shadows video. I am genuinely sorry, but moving my microphone from when I was reading made the entire rest of the video out of focus. And I had no idea until I was almost done editing the entire thing several hours in. So I really, really apologize. And I hope you can forgive me. Thank you. This video mostly covers specific niche details, but also goes into the more like misogynistic side of James's content. Please watch Todd's video because there's not much to comment on and I can't clip it because it's age restricted. And I just kind of want to bring up an overall overarching point in his video that I found to be very valuable. I think that the reason why James gets things wrong when he was getting things wrong in the way that he does is that, and I think the biggest takeaway that I have from Todd's video is most of James's original content, as in the few things that he did say himself, were misogynistic, ignorant, overindulgent of the, like reading too far between the lines of the words that he plagiarized. It's when you don't actually make your own conclusions because you're not effectively doing your own research. You lose the intimate understanding of the content itself and that really just falls to the wayside. James is, in a way, trying to paint by numbers a blank canvas. If that makes any sense, he's taking pieces in a way that removes the context and the construct that they're placed in and just kind of does random, like, connecting clauses in order for it to kind of make sense. But in those random connecting clauses, he needs to find an element between the two, and he's often finding the wrong one. Now, if we continue to Jesse Gender's video talking about solidarity and community within the LGBTQIA plus creator space, Jesse talks about how she had a conversation with James and that he was rejecting the community aspect and just kind of thought about it as I am credible enough that people can just come to me. And this feeds back into the concept of genre as a community and how content becomes sort of a communal experience, which is what I was talking about from Miller's essay. In other words, James essentially just thought he could speak for everyone and the sort of community solidarity wasn't necessary. But when that happens and you're running around stealing other people's work, when things like this happen, nobody has your back and nobody could guide you into a better direction before something like this happens. Jesse also talks about the erasure of marginalized communities with this attitude that he has because if he's like, nobody can, needs to come to anybody else, they can just come from me. When you're just siphoning other people's words for your own that are marginalized, you're removing the ability for them to profit off of these things in a way that they can support themselves and they can do more research. You're removing any ability for them to have an, their own unique voice. So as the final part of this video, we're going to do a bit of a rhetorical analysis for the apology video that was uploaded, deleted, and re-uploaded by a third party in the amount of time it took me to paint a pottery strawberry cow and go to sleep. Before we get into the points of the apology, I do want to discuss motives and the function of persuasion as a means of forgiveness. And from this, we're going to do the final reading for the video from Kenneth Burke's The Rhetoric of Motives. Yet often we could with more accuracy speak of persuasion attitude rather than persuasion to out and out action. Persuasion involves choice, will. It is directed to a man only insofar as he is free. This is good to remember in these days of dictatorship and near dictatorship. Only insofar as men are potentially free must the spellbinder seek to persuade them. Insofar as they must do something, rhetoric is unnecessary. It works being done by the nature of things, though often these necessities are out of natural origin, but, but come from necessities imposed by man-made conditions, as with the kind of pethimanke, which is a word of a different language, I don't know, but it says, or compulsion under the guise of persuasion, that sometimes flows from the nature of the free market. Insofar as the action is restricted, rhetoric seeks rather to have a formative effect upon attitude. As a criminal condemned to death might by priestly rhetoric be brought to an attitude of repentance and resignation. Thus, in Cicero and Augustine, there's a shift between the words move and bend to name the ultimate function of rhetoric. This shift corresponds to a distinction between the act and the attitude. 
attitude being an incipient act and leaning into the inclination. Thus, the notion of persuasion to attitude would permit the application of rhetorical terms to purely poetic structures. The study of lyrical, the study of lyrical devices might be classed under the head of rhetoric. And when the devices are considered for their power to introduce the commutative states of mind to the readers, even though the kinds to ascend have evoked no overt particular outcome. This is when this is what describes essentially the fact that James's apology, he was screwed from the jump. Right. So he's saying that it's it's it will only be able to have rhetorical power if they don't have to do something. And as the, if they're not forced into a corner, James has been so demonstrably proven that he plagiarizes, that he doesn't care about the plagiarism, that he blows off the allegations. There is no room for that persuasion to come into place. Now, I say this because Harris proves in his video as well. This isn't the first time someone's called him a plagiarist. This isn't the, the first time people have brought it to him. And every single time that somebody has, he made a point to be very narcissistic in tone and very rude and patronizing to people and denounce that criticism or those allegations. And Harris includes those clips in the video. But over the last couple of years, Somerton has been repeatedly accused of plagiarism. In response, Somerton has claimed he never ripped off anyone and the times he did weren't even that bad anyway. If I had been plagiarizing videos, I wouldn't have a channel. I would be called out all the time by people saying he stole my shit, but I don't plagiarize. The one time that there actually was plagiarism, it was by mistake and I fixed it immediately and it is no longer in my video. And the other two accusations, one was silly. That's an interesting way of saying you didn't do it. Uh, when three or four separate videos have three or four separate plagiarism controversies attached, there's not three or four. Somerton is telling the truth here. There are not three or four accusations. Whenever these allegations are brought up, however, a fan of his will normally pop up to accuse them of harassing a gay man and claim this is all part of a deliberate homophobic campaign against a queer creator. And as an open bisexual who knows what the internet is like, I'm vigilant to the possibility the phobes are making a fuss about nothing again to take down a fellow gay boy. It does happen. So keeping this possibility in mind, I looked at what he'd been accused of for myself, weighed up all the evidence as objectively as I could, and it quickly became clear he did do it. He's a massive plagiarist. In fact, there's a bunch of stuff no one else has found yet. He's just convinced his audience to attack people when they notice. So not only if you're someone like me and you're introduced to James in this context, you get to see direct examples of him doing it, direct examples of people telling him that he's doing it, direct examples of his inability to take the criticism and change and actually make his own content, and the willingness to hide it. So the video begins with James talking about how he was hospitalized for doing something stupid and his dad called 911. Then two minutes in, he begins to say that he doesn't want the video to be a sob. This is an attempt I find to invoke emotion as a more long-standing effect for the rest of the video that he's coming in with. Then he continues by saying that what he did was just not crediting enough. Again, I went through this again and again throughout the video. You can't just take someone's entire essay and even if you cite them, it's still not yours. The stuff in the videos, not crediting people. And <laughs> for a lot of videos, you know, I, I did the opening titles thing and I tried to put like, this is based on X's, this person's research or this person's book. But I, I know, I, I know now that that wasn't, that wasn't enough. That wasn't okay. And, and then there were a lot of times that, uh, there were a lot of times that stuff just got put in and there was no attempt at crediting anybody. He says he does not realize that he was hurting people, despite, again, as I mentioned, previous callous responses to people saying that this is horrible and you're silencing people. And thus he makes it a selfish expression of emotion. Then he adds in details of losing the co-author as a friend. So then he evokes a similar definition, I find, of the or giving credit thing that Illuminati was doing. And I will play that definition again before the clip of James that I'm thinking of. Before we get into that, when I was trying to pull this clip and I was visiting Illuminati's channel again as I was editing, I was like, let me click on a recent video just to see what the vibes are like. So I on the screen, you can see it. It's cosmic surgery for dogs. Look at that like to dislike ratio. Holy sweet Moses on earth. Plus the the comments are turned off. Plus she still has that mint mobile sponsorship. Super epic. So I love the double down insistence on 
shittiness that Blair has. It's really something unique to her, I feel like, at this point. And I know that, like, I have the plug-in for the dislikes, and it might not be the most accurate, but it's not so inaccurate that it would be a good ratio by any means, because that looks like a 90% dislike ratio, almost, maybe 80, which is nuts, because most of my videos have a 92 to 98% like ratio on average. Or the word plagiarism as defined by Merriam-Webster, Dictionary.com, and the University of Oxford. I'm showing multiple sources defining plagiarism, but the overall definition is gonna boil down to this. Plagiarism is to take someone else's idea as their own or to not credit the source. But again, I'm really, really, really sorry for the things that I did in the videos. <clears throat> Copying people's work and not crediting them properly or at all. I also want to apologize for the, the misinformation, outright lies that ended up in the videos. I can I honestly say that I never intended for any of that to, any of that stuff to be in the videos. In most cases, I didn't write it, but I should have, you know, it was my face on the channel. It was my name on the channel. I should have been, I should have been more diligent. And he says that most of the time I didn't write the incorrect stuff. And then, goes down the line to say, oh, I'm not trying to throw my co-writer under the bus. Then who's writing it, girl? There's only two of you. Like, let's be real, okay? Then he continues that he wants to become a really good example of crediting authors. So what he's trying to do now is kind of prepare people for this attempt at, like, making himself a martyr. In a then he doubles down that any of the offensive stuff he didn't write, and he says that he trusted Nick's judgment, then immediately says that he isn't throwing him under the bus, as I mentioned. And then at 23, this is a 35 minute long video, by the way, at 23 minutes, he states that he wanted to make more videos that he felt he actually liked and sort of saying that the audience pushed him into making videos he didn't want to make. And that's why he plagiarized them, which is such an absurd concept. We ended up making a lot of videos we didn't want to make um, because people were asking for them. And so there were a lot of videos we made that we didn't want to make. And I think those videos are very clear on which ones those were. Um, one of them never got officially released. It was released to patrons. Some patrons have shared it to other people before all the videos went private. Um, and a lot of people hate the analysis that Nick and I did on it. Um, and so maybe it's good that that never got properly released because maybe it would have hurt people. And I don't want that. If you're trying to do fan service, that's your choice to make money and be greedy. So then it's not their fault that that's happened. That doesn't even make sense. Once again, he dilutes the plagiarism to laziness. The whole end part is just him rambling about, oh, Harris was so great for making the video and giving the money to them. I want to also give money to them. How am I going to give them the fund? I'm going to public all my other old videos and give the new AdSense. And then he says he wants to keep creating. Now, here's my thing, okay? If he creates on the same channel, his new videos that he's going to keep the money from are going to be pushing the algorithm off of the momentum of the other videos, especially because once the videos go back live, everyone's going to want to look at them because of Harris pointing out all the issues with them. So again, I do see greed in that. If you really wanted to be honest, I think you would want to start from scratch on a different channel, but that could be me being a nitpicky drama YouTuber. That's a joke. I'm just kidding. Take away from this is the concept of James just seeing this as primarily a monetary, a monetary exchange. And that's the biggest issue from him stealing it is their money, not even necessarily their intellectual property or their desire for research. Here's the thing. The H bomber guy, again, the video came out after multiple public confrontations from even the authors themselves. Everything was dismissed or ignored with this horrible attitude. So there had to be somebody to push it off the edge. That was the only foreseeable way that this could continue forward. And that concludes the saga, at least for now. To conclude, plagiarism is so much more than just profiting, profiting off of someone else's videos and goes so far beyond the academic context. This was an incredibly well done video. This was a topic that I find to be very interesting and something that I really wanted to dip my foot in. Links, sources of ways to support the channel all down below. Thank you again to my members and patrons. Email down below to suggest longer form content. Now I'm going to include a silly little TikTok that will include the watermark of the creator who made it. And I will also link it down below as long as it's not already deleted. Now you kids have an amazing day. Merry holiday. And I will see you when I see you.
Bye. On the 12 days of Rizmus, my Rizzler gave to me. 12 Fortnite matches, 11 Rizzlers Rizzing, 10 Grimace Shakes, 9 Hours Edging, 8 Gritties Grittied, Level 7 Gyat, 6 Milli Vanillies, 5 Nights at Freddy's. Four YouTube shorts, three phantom taxes, two upper deckies, and a toilet, so skibbity.